Marxism and Freedom by Rhea Dunievskaya. Chapter 2. Classical Political Economy, the Revolts of the Workers, and the Utopian Socialists. The Industrial Revolution had uprooted the masses from the land. The industrial capitalists separated them from their instruments of labor and their homes. It was as if a tornado had swept over them, and the only thing left in sight was the factory, which was sucking them in as a collection of hands. They had to bow to it because it was now their only means of making a livelihood. Our modern world was born. Production and more production became the theory because it was the life of the new mechanism. The industrial capitalists took command of society. The chaotic state of economic inquiry was transformed into the system of classical political economy at the very time when the industrial revolution undermined the foundations on which the merchant capitalist as well as the small master manufacturer stood. Classical political economy, which was born in 1776 with the publication of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, reached its height and end in 1821 with the publication of David Ricardo's Political Economy and Taxation. The classical theory proclaimed that the wealth of nations was not something outside of men, like precious metals or land or foreign trade, but in man's activity itself. Man should stop looking for gold and busy himself with production. That is what is decisive. The greatest force of production is labor. It is the source of all value. The labor theory of value created as great a revolution in man's thinking as the industrial revolution had in man's conditions of living. Heretofore, the dominant theory had been that of the mercanti mercantilists, merchant capitalists, who had argued that wealth results from buying cheap and selling dear. Therefore, they contended a great market such as the American colonies could not be given up without England itself falling. Preceding the mercantilists was the physiocratic school, which argued that agricultural labor was the source of wealth. Just as the successful American Revolution gave the final blow to mercantilist theory, so the Industrial Revolution delivered the final blow to the physiocratic theory. Production and more production, the wedding of science and industry, said classical political economy would lead the world to ever increased happiness and development. The bourgeoisie embraced the philosophy of classical political economy, production for production's sake. They embraced it all the more readily because the labor theory of value was a single law and as compelling a phenomenon as the outward forms of regulation of feudalism. At one and the same time, it gave an integrated view of the economic system and assigned labor its place in society at the point of production. Somehow, order had emerged from the seeming anarchy brought on by the Industrial Revolution in which, in which each industrialist produced for himself without state regulation and without knowing his market. Economic man, it was asserted, would henceforward work for his individual interests and somehow this would prove to be best for society as a whole. Free competition would fully cleanse justice and equality of feudal privileges and inequalities. The possessors of equal rights would exchange freely according to the quantity of labor embodied in their commodities. The classical political economy worked within a given class society, capitalism, which it took for the eternal or natural order. Its great merit was that it revealed the innermost law of bourgeois production. The laborer is paid at value. It is true that these classicists substituted the laborer for labor and looked at the working man as a commodity, as a thing. But thereby they discovered labor's cost of production, namely the means of subsistence necessary to enable the laborer to work and reproduce his kind. Thus, also, a glaring capitalist contradiction was revealed. The laborer was getting only what was necessary to produce him, and all the surplus he produced was appropriated by the capitalist. From the equality of exchange in general arose the inequality of exchange of the particular commodity of the particular commodity labor.
Ricardo never doubted that unhampered production would somehow eliminate all evils and right all things in this integrated natural world of his. He continued to attribute the irrationalities in his rational system either to feudal vestiges or to governmental interference. The theories of the Enlightenment had asserted that knowledge and science released from feudal aristocratic despotism would bring about a harmonious world. This concept was smashed to smithereens by the social political revolution in France. Not only did industry and science break up the feudal order, they revealed new antagonisms from the very start. As we saw, that greatest bourgeois philosopher, Hegel, sensed the irre irreconcilable contradictions of modern society. Though he did not accept Ricardo's natural order, he too stood on the basis of classical economics and he too looked at labor, not the laborer. Or, more precisely, having once looked at the laborer, he turned quickly away never to look at him again. Nor, for that matter, was classical political economy unaware of the sufferings of the people. But these sufferings seemed a small price to pay for the birth pangs of the natural order of society, freed at last from all feudal restrictions and state interference. 1. The continuous revolts of the workers and the end of classical political economy. The laborer, who had been left out of Ricardo's analysis, loomed very large in the actual development of capitalist society. From the very birth of industrial capitalism, the laborer had been in constant revolt. At first, he could see no reason at all to crowd into the towns and give up his personal freedom. The revulsion against going into the factory, with its prison discipline, was so strong that laws were enacted against vagabondage, to force him into the factory. Once brought into the factory, their oppression forced the workers to uprisings against the instrument of labor, the machine. The first laws against the breakup of, breakup of machines were passed in 1769. What amazed the bourgeois ideologists was the workers' seemingly abject submission to the machine on the one hand and the violent strikes on the other hand. The new factory workers who had been compelled to sign away their personal freedom to become one of a collection of hands working under conditions common to all evolved a new method of revolt. Combinations, or the first form of trade unions, emerged. The bourgeoisie retaliated immediately by passing the Anti-Combination Acts of 1799 and 1800. This time, however, the laws were unsuccessful. The factory workers had discovered a new power, that of being together at a place forced upon them by the industrial capitalist. Thus, they were united and disciplined by the very instrument of production which coerced them. They continued to form their combinations despite the harsh laws and prison terms. Uprisings continued and were put down in blood, from the Luddite riots in 1811 and 1812 to, to the Lyons Uprising or the Lyon Uprisings in 1834. But they had won the repeal of the Anti-Combination Acts in 1824. In 1844, the Silesian weavers in their revolt signaled a new stage in their development. They not only broke the machines, they tore up the titles to the machines and burned the deeds. Trade unions sprung up everywhere and strikes were on the order of the day. Now, however, the workers were striking not against the machine, but against the uncontrolled power of capital. They questioned the capitalist principle of a certain quantity of money for a certain quantity of labor. They questioned the conditions of labor. They questioned the hours of labor. They demanded certain wages, factory inspection, a limit on the hours of labor. Then they turned against the legislators. Along with the fight of the trade unions for the 10 hours bill, the English workers also organized the Chartist movement and demanded universal suffrage. Meanwhile, the first great general capitalist crisis had broken up, broken upon an unsuspecting world in 1825. Another crisis erupted in 1837. Overproduction and depression, phenomena quite unknown before, now became normal. The Ricardian school was battered on the one side by recurring crises and on the other side by the revolts of labor. Why should he who creates all the wealth, asked the laborer, become poorer the more values he creates?
Why, asked the capitalist, should his system of production be wrecked by crises, although production was unhampered? What about the integrated whole society run by a single economic law? Where Ricardo had been unable to solve the contradictions in his theory of labor value, his fo followers could make no headway. That was not because they were merely followers and he was an original thinker. The, the objective conditions developed the contradictions further. Crises and class struggles wrought havoc with a school of thought that had been scientific enough to pose contradictions, but bourgeois enough to reject the laborer who would develop these contradictions to the end. The failure of the Ricardian theory to explain the exchange between capital and labor on the basis of its own primary law of labor value meant the disintegration of that school. Nassau Sr.'s infamous theory of the 11th hour, the theory that all profit was created only in the 11th hour and that therefore any reduction of the working day to 10 hours would mean the end of the whole productive system, sounded the death knell of bourgeois economics as a science. Bourgeois e economists became transformed into what Marx called hired prize fighters in the interests of the capitalist class. The greater the crises, the more numerous and violent the strikes, the more machines were introduced. The whole capitalist philosophy of production was reduced to training human beings to renounce their de desultory habits of work and to identify themselves with the unvarying regularity of the complex automation. Two, the utopian socialists and Pierre Proudhon, a case of mental juggling. The classicists' philosophy of production and more production, which Marx called production for the sake of production, gave modern industry the needed scope in which to develop. The actual development disclosed the condition of modern production and demonstrated that the welfare of the masses, the producers, does not at all flow from the growth of wealth. The crying inequalities of distribution arising from this method of production could not but arouse the sympathy of the intellectual for the proletariat. Being outside of production, however, the intellectual could not see that the working class had power to overthrow the contradictory conditions of production. For the intellectual, the proletariat existed only as a suffering class. The utopian socialist had the excuse that in its infancy, the industrial working class did not, on the morrow of the bourgeois revolution, form an independent mass movement. The petty bourgeois intellectual continued to remain outside the mass movement, even when the actions of the proletariat had crystallized into organizational forms on both the economic and political fronts. Proudhon, our most typical and most important example, opposed strikes and combinations because they only made all things dear. He opposed I don't understand. He opposed political movements because they did not follow the pattern his mind had conceived. Mm -hmm. While classical political economy suffered disintegration as a bourgeois school of thought, a crop of utopian socialists arose who wanted to use the classical theory of labor as the source of value for the working class. The utopian socialists based themselves on the Ricardian theory of value, which they claimed to be socialist and required only cleansing of its capitalistic conclusions. If, went the argument, labor is the source of all value, it must therefore be the source of all surplus value and the fruits of labor rightfully belong to labor. As Marx put it, the significance of the utopian socialists was that they corresponded to the first instructive de -social, or de desires of the masses to reorganize society. Their continued existence, when the masses moved in another direction, could mean nothing but a reactionary movement in opposition to the actual movement of the proletariat. The utopian socialists stayed away from the living movement of the working class. In England, there were the trade unions and the Chartist movement, but Robert Owen, who had done much in revealing the actual conditions in the factories of England, held himself apart from this real movement of the proletariat. Although it was the suffering of the masses that broke the bourgeois intellectuals from their own class and brought them near the proletariat, they believed not one iota in the creative initiative of the masses. Nothing surprised Owen so much as when he returned to England after having built the new Harmony colony in America.
to find that the trade unions, one million strong, were ready to adopt his schemes. Being proletarians, however, they knew the way to do that seriously was through a revolutionary mass movement. They were ready to get rid of the employer class. They were prepared to call a general strike and reorganize industry on a cooperative basis. At first, Owen appeared to be with them. Then he backed away, and while the real movement collapsed under the extreme persecution of the government, his own organi organization became more and more ethical. Pierre Proudhon was the most important figure of these utopian sects. He opposed trade unions in England and strikes everywhere. At the very moment that Marx was predicting that Germany was on the eve of revolution, Proudhon proved that the masses had outgrown revolution. He no sooner wrote that, the, that when the revolutions burst out in France and Germany, it was not a theoretical question. The question was not whether Proudhon did or did not predict correctly. The question was what to do. Where Marx was always with the revolutionary working class, these intellectuals, including the self-made ones like Proudhon, in action always opposed it. Marx wrote, in place of the great historic movement arising from the conflict between the productive forces already acquired by man and their social relations, which no longer correspond to these productive forces, in place of the practical and violent action of the masses by which alone these conflicts can be resolved, in place of this vast, prolonged, and complicated movement, Monsieur Proudhon supplies the evacuating motion of his own head. Instead of analyzing or aligning himself with the actual historical development of the masses, Proudhon had evolved the development of a universal reason, the absolute truth which gave birth to a few classless moral ideas such as justice and equality. Were political economy infused with these, he argued, value would come into its own and the Ricardian theory would be righted by granting everyone titles to property. Proudhon's final discovery was to have people's banks. The People's Bank, Free Credit, and Organization of Exchange came naturally to Proudhon, for his whole conception of value was that it was something quantitative, a matter of such and such a proportion of the products of national wealth. He found no fault with the existing production relations that couldn't be solved simply by changing the legal titles to property. If, in addition, money were made only a circulating medium, all would be righted in his world. He therefore proposed that instead of money being loaned at interest, it should be sold and bought at cost like any other commodity. To his mind, the evil seemed to stem from the fact that upon gold was conferred an economic privilege by the sovereignty of the state. All the evils of capitalism seemed to be a malicious perversion on the part of the governments rather than a result of the method of commodity production. As though the class struggle were a mere abstraction in his mind, like his system of contradictions, this intellectual anarchist conceived the conflict soluble by the right idea. Proudhon's right idea was the synthesis of the good sides of the opposing forces brought about by reunited labor and property within the present system of production, which was to remain intact. Where Marx placed the proletariat in the center of all his thinking, Proudhon placed the small producer. His goal was to remove the middlemen from between the capitalist and the worker, parcel out the land and industry, and establish a society of equal producers. His conception was that exchange could be organized equitably, if only the merchant and the banker did not have mon monopolistic power granted them by the government. This good petty bourgeois mistook his weaving between the two major classes of modern society, the workers and the capitalists, for the discovery of the point of equilibrium between these two great opposing forces. Proudhon elaborated his fantasy and philosophy of poverty. Marx hit back with poverty of philosophy. Marx argued that no try to or that oh, fuck. Marx argued that to try to organize exchange, to try to bring order into the anarchy of the market in a society based on factory production, must mean its organization according to the division of labor in the factory, where the authority of the capitalist is undisputed. To try to bring that principle of authority into society as a whole could only mean subjecting society to one single master. This profound prediction of the totalitarianism to which abstract planning would inevitably lead had no effect on the Proudhonist movement in France.
where retarded ind industrial development made idealization of the small producer natural. The small peasant, the petty industrialist, the semi-proletarian, these Proudhon enthroned in his socialism. Not being subjected to the despotism of the labor process under capitalism, Proudhon thought to solve all problems by leaving commodity production intact and creating money for all with his schemes for free credit. A decade later in the United States, that is exactly what Vanderbilt had too much of when watered railroad stocks came crashing over his head. Where labor had created no value, not the Vanderbilts, not the Golds, nor the government could fabricate it. This Proudhon could not imagine. He had already decided that the workers could save up small shares, set up workshops, and by giving up interest and in profit, soon buy all the capital of France from the bourgeoisie. That would indeed make a piker of Peter Minuit, who bought the island of Manhattan from the Indians for a reputed $25. The year 1848 swept away the pretensions of the radical intellectuals. It was necessary, however, to expose the theoretical root of the error of organizing exchange, and Marx turned to it in his economic works.